Good evening, everyone. A uh, big welcome and thank you to, uh, to all our panelists for joining and to our audience as well um, for being here with us. We have a tremendous event ahead of us. Um, we're now live streaming from Facebook as well. Um, you can go to facebook.com slash Canada policy and um, you can join, uh, join us there and you can help us to amplify um, this evening's discussion as well um, in that way. You can help us amplify the discussion through Twitter. Um, we've got links to accounts that you can follow in the chat. Um, our hashtags for tonight's event are hashtag Kashmir Action Canada, hashtag Kashmir Action, and hashtag Free Kashmir. There's also an amazing Twitter storm um, kit that you can get at freecashmere.org. So my name is Bianca Majeni. I am with the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute, which is one of the organizations that is presenting this event tonight. Um, before we begin, I want to acknowledge that many of us are gathered here today on Indigenous land. Canada was built on colonial violence that is both historical and ongoing. And as we see from uh, what Suetan, um, struggles to Mi'kmaq struggles on opposite ends of the country. Um, this violence is ongoing. So today I'm speaking to you from Montreal, Jojage, which is situated on the traditional territory of the Ganiangahaga uh, people. It's a place that has long served as a site of meeting and exchange among many First Nations. And I recognize and respect uh, the Ganiangahaga as the traditional custodians of the land that I'm on. So as I mentioned earlier, I'm with the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute, and our role is to challenge unjust uh, foreign policy measures. And we aim to bridge the gap between the perception and the reality of Canada's role in the world. And we launched with a no to Canada on the United Nations Security Council uh, campaign. And after Canada's second consecutive defeat for a seat on the United Nations Security Council in June, we launched a call for a fundamental reassessment of Canadian foreign policy. And this has been signed by more than 50 organizations, including Greenpeace Canada, 350, 350 Canada, as well as four sitting MPs, David, Su David Suzuki, Naomi Klein, Stephen Lewis, and many others. So you can find out more about this campaign for a reset of Canadian foreign policy at foreignpolicy.ca. So we're holding this event because Kashmir is one of the longest standing international conflicts in which Canada has been silent since August 5th of 2019. India has illegally annexed the territory, downgraded its status, and put the Valley of Kashmir under siege. The world's most militarized zone is under serious threat of demographic change that's aimed at altering the final resolution of this disputed territory. And despite all of this, the Canadian government has remained troublingly silent um, through all of this on Kashmir. So there are three petitions on the issue right now that have been presented recently in Parliament by Liberal MP Ratansi, NDP MP Duval, and by the Conservative MP Gladu. And a reply is expected to these in a few weeks. Um, so there are actions that are being taken. And I must say that I'm thrilled to be a part of tonight's event. Um, it feels historic. There's 25 Canadian civil society organizations that are supporting tonight's forum. Um, and we have a stellar lineup of lawyers, academics, authors, activists for what we believe is the first such civil society foreign policy discussion uh, in Canada regarding Kashmir. So our panel today is going to explore the history of the conflict, geopolitical perspectives, international law, human rights, um, and Hindu nationalism and the colonization of Kashmir. Our guest speakers, our esteemed guest speakers include attorney Imran Mir, co-founder of the Kashmir Law and Justice Project, Haley Dushinsky, associate professor of anthropology and the graduate director of the Center for Law, Justice and Culture at Ohio University. Um, Malavika Kasturi, associate professor of South Asian history at the University of Toronto. Sadiq Waid, scholar in residence at the Center for Public Affairs and Critical Theory at Shiv uh, Nadar University, and Aziza Kanji, a legal and academic writer. So this webinar um, is co-sponsored by a large number of Canadian NGOs, as well as um, the very popular media platform, rabble.ca. Um, 
And the sponsoring NGOs, um, there, are there are too many to name right now, but they include Canadians for Peace and Justice in Kashmir, Just Peace Advocates, Friends of Kashmir Canada, World Beyond War, Canadians Against Oppression and Persecution, Kashmir Scholars Consultative Action Network, Academics Against Hate, Sami Dun Palestinian Prisoner Solidarity Network, Critical Kashmir Studies, Canadian Palestine Association, Stand with Kashmir, South Asian Dalit and uh, an Adivasi network and several others. Um, and before we turn to our uh, panelists, uh, Ikra Khalid, uh, member of parliament from Mississauga, Aaron Mills um, has kindly, um, uh, kindly offered us a video um, and a, a message of support. Um, and so we're gonna turn to that now before, uh, before we go to our panelists. Hello, this is Ikra Khalid, member of parliament from Mississauga, Aaron Mills. Firstly, I want to thank the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute for hosting this discussion on this important topic. As a member of Parliament, I believe that I have the responsibility and the privilege for being the voice of the voiceless. As a member of the International Human Rights Subcommittee, I have shed light on human rights issues around the world as they arise, whether it be for the Rohingya genocide, the persecution of Christian minorities or the people of Burundi, and so many more. Hearing first-hand experience of human rights violations from affected peoples around the world has led me to a deeper understanding and respect for the role that human rights play in maintaining peace and harmony in any region. I have and will continue to advocate for human rights here in Canada and globally because I have seen the difference that we can make. Since August of 2019, I have been listening keenly to many voices in my writing of Mississauga Aaron Mills raise concerns for the people of Kashmir. The people of Kashmir are a vibrant and thriving community that is worth protecting. I am concerned for their ongoing conditions as they reportedly continue to face curfews, limited access to food supplies and communications. Our government is deeply concerned about escalations and detention. In fact, our Minister of Global Affairs met with Kashmiri Canadians to directly hear about their first-hand experience and the plight of their families and loved ones stuck in a deplorable situation. I have spoken many times about this issue and will continue to advocate for the well-being of the people of Kashmir. It is time for all parties in the international community to sit together and find a peaceful solution that preserves and protects the rights of innocent Kashmiri people. As shown by multiple UNSC resolutions, one of which Canada co-sponsored, there is a path toward peace and justice. That path is carved through the safeguarding of human rights of the people of Kashmir. I will continue my advocacy for the protection of human life and liberty, and will continue to work with Kashmiri Canadians and our government to push that needle forward. Thank you again for your advocacy. Uh, that was a wonderful message. A lot of appreciation um, to uh, MP um, Ikra Khalid for helping to break the parliamentary silence on this issue. She's also a member of uh, the Human Rights um, Committee as well. So uh, at the Institute, we always encourage uh, people to get active. So we ask you to write to your MPs. There's a petition. Um, we're gonna be putting that in the chat um, both in the Facebook lives as well as in um, the Zoom chat, asking your MPs to demand action from Canada on Kashmir. Um, you can find this at justiceforallcanada.org slash free Kashmir. Um, you can sign the petition. Also, um, that, is, that has been um, submitted to the House of Commons that's demanding that the Liberals condemn the government of India's settle, settlement colonization that is now underway in Kashmir. So this has also been posted in the chat. Um, so please take a look uh, and take action. So in a bit of housekeeping, um, I just wanna say welcome again to the panelists. Um, and it's great to see um, this turnout. Um, I want to remind people that they can let their friends know if they haven't registered, that there is a live stream that you can find. Um, and also in terms of the flow of today's event, um, we're gonna be hearing from our panelists and then there's gonna be um, a bit of discussion between the panelists and if time allows, we will have a Q&A from the audience as well. So please send us your questions. We'll be monitoring questions from the live stream as well as um, 
a, a Q&A that you can actually post into in the Zoom. And, um, you know, we just ask that you, we know there's a lot, we know there's a lot of opinions on this issue and we just ask that you engage respectfully um, regarding any questions or commentary that you may have and any content that is racist or sexist or otherwise harmful is, is very unwelcome. So we're now gonna hear from our speakers. Um, the first panelist of the evening is Imran Mir. Imran Mir is an attorney, author and entrepreneur. He's uh, researched and written on various topics related to Kashmir and is co-founder of the Kashmir Law and Justice Project. He's a graduate of Harvard College and Harvard Law School. Welcome Imran. Thank you. So I'm gonna be giving a little bit of context and also talking specifically uh, with reference to international law. I'm gonna start with the claim. When the history of the collapse of the now prevailing order is written, I think Kashmir, August, 2019, will be a key inflection point. A point after which salvaging that order became practically impossible. First, let me contextualize that claim and then I'll explain it. In 1846, as the United Kingdom, as a colonial power in pursuit of its imperialist agenda, created a state called Jammu and Kashmir and installed a warlord as its ruler. That warlord regime brutally repressed and suppressed the indigenous people of that territory with British support. There was an indigenous, anti-colonial, pro-democracy, pro-self-determination struggle. Sorry for my video. Can you hear me? Sorry, the video yes, cut out. Yes, we can hear and see you great. Perfect. Your video's back. There was an indigenous, anti-colonial, pro-democracy, pro-self-determination struggle that antedated the creation of the states of India and Pakistan, and also is distinct from the anti-colonial movement that you might be familiar with in British India. After the creation of the states of India and Pakistan, at the very moment that the indigenous self-determination struggle finally deposed that warlord regime, India intervened to prop up the regime and manufacture for itself a claim to the territory. What ensued is the first India-Pakistan war India takes the dispute to the United Nations in December of 1947. The Security Council, in dealing with this dispute, did not recognize India's claim to the territory. And as a matter of both law and policy, there is no reasonable basis for that claim to be recognized. There was and is, however, a known and recognized solution to determining the political future of the territory. And that is exercised by its people of their right to self-determination. That is mandated by various Security Council resolutions is also pursuant to generally applicable international law, British post-colonial policy, and even the deal, although that deal itself is legally null and void, that India cut with the warlord regime in order to manufacture its territorial claim. The right to self-determination is in fact agreed by all parties to the dispute, or at least was, including India and Pakistan. Instead of fulfilling its obligations, India annexed and colonized the territory. What then ensued was the most militarized colonial occupation in the world. There were massive violations of international humanitarian law and human rights law over decades with an intense escalation since 1990. I think Haley will be talking something about that. There have been rampant atrocity crimes, war crimes, crimes against humanity and zero accountability. In fact, under Indian law, War crimes and crimes against humanity in Kashmir are effectively legally sanctioned. Since August of 2019, there has been a further escalation of violations by the Indian colonizers of Kashmir. This is in connection with the achievement of a major policy goal of Indian supremacists or fascists. I think Malavika will be discussing this in more detail. There was a lockdown and a crackdown on rights no international access, no communications, no journalism, total surveillance, mass incarceration, mass torture, no permitted expression, no free movement, a campaign of extrajudicial killing and property destruction, the closure of schools, economic strangulation. That lockdown is now over 14 months old. In connection with that, India imposed a new legal regime, including certain quote unquote constitutional changes. What's referred to if you follow the media at all, the abrogation of Article 370 of India's constitution, these relate to Kashmir. These were in fact, and should be understood as self-serving bad faith illegalities that are built on long-standing self-serving bad faith illegalities. The effect of these laws, and the other speakers I think will go in more depth, is very significant. 
They sanctioned the gutting of the foundations of the local economy, the economic welfare of the people, their food security. They further disintegrated and disempowered an already divided and disempowered indigenous population. They legalized and incentivized forced demographic change or settler colonialism. Since then, certain violations of international humanitarian law, which are not new, have been occurring on an unprecedented scale. These include the expropriation of property, disregard for local laws, the expansion and incentivization of forced population transfer, and the desecration of cultural property. And here's a key point. Kashmir is where a post-colonial constitutional democracy, talking about India, fully embraced authoritarianism on its path to full-blown fascism. And a second key point, the reality that I just described is not acknowledged or even recognized. Kashmir is a pairing of two things, fundamental violations and systematic successful distortion of reality. So consider for a second what colonialism is under international law. It is a subjection of peoples to alien subjugation, domination and exploitation when a state denies an indigenous population its right to self-determination. India has colonized Kashmir for decades. Settler colonialism is a major step beyond colonialism. It is the colonizers manufacturing of indigeneity by displacing and replacing an indigenous population. This is what India is now accelerating in Kashmir. These phenomena are not, right, not only an outright assault on the people of that place, but also an assault on the international order and international law. Self-determination is a fundamental principle of inter international law. In fact, it is its moral and intellectual foundation. Similarly, respect for human rights is fundamental to the prevailing order. In the conception of international law, the exercise of the right to self-determination is fundamental to the realization of every other human right. So beyond this, why is Kashmir 2019 an inflection point? Kashmir is the world's leading laboratory, and I'm gonna summarize of a state of total unfreedom through a nominal democracy, authoritarianism, the legalization of state terror and impunity, the silencing of truth and dissent, and the creation of conditions conducive to genocide through the nominal rule of law, economic devastation through nominal liberal liberalization, and a state of near perfect disinformation through private media. At the same time, Kashmir remains ground zero for the next world war, and a potential nuclear holocaust, and I think Sadiq will be talking about that, as well as ground zero for the not so slow motion climate catastrophe that we are all participating in. And the final key component of this picture, beyond fundamental violations, as I said before, and reality distortion, is the deep complicity of the international community. The UN was created primarily to secure international peace and security in the aftermath of militant ethno-nationalism and the 20th century world wars. India is the leading fascist militant ethno-nationalist power in the world. It is belligerent, expansionist. It has a history of conflict, of provoking conflict. It is a terrorist state and a state sponsor of terror. For Indian fascists, the disintegration and destruction of Kashmir is a major victory and a historic achievement. It has empowered and emboldened them. At the same time, the UN and the international community, including Canada, and I think Aziza is gonna talk about this a bit, have been deeply involved in all that's happened in Kashmir since 1948. There's an extensive record at the Security Council of the UN's involvement. There have been UN peacekeepers on the ground observing massive violations since 1948. So take the example of Canada, the first Canadian to die as a UN peacekeeper is a guy by the name of Her uh, Harry Herbert Engel, who was killed on July 17, 1950, while serving as the UN's chief military advisor in Kashmir. This combination of an oversight role and permissiveness is the sanctioning of violations. And it's not just passive complicity, it's active complicity, in particular in the organized lying through which India distorts reality. India is treated as a good actor in the world, the world's largest democracy, and not as a rogue state. But consider that India no longer recognizes the UN's peacekeeping mission in Kashmir. For example, it no longer admits UN human rights observers. It no longer even responds to UN bodies in respect of its violations, except to condemn them. So for example, in the context of the 2018 and 2019 reports 
by the Office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights on human rights violations in Kashmir, India outright rejected the reports, calling them fallacious, tendentious, and politically motivated. And my example of sort of the case in point on this is India's June 2020 election as a non-permanent member of the Security Council, 184 of 192 UN member states affirmatively voted to elect India. But to give you a sense of the obscenity of that, again, India is a rogue state that acts in defiance of the Security Council, doesn't recognize the Security Council's authority, actually sanctions crimes against humanity, but it got more votes than even Canada. And I know your organization opposed Canada's election, but just think about that contextually. Um, and incidentally, I would say that one of India's publicly announced goals for its time on the Security Council is to remove Kashmir from the Security Council's agenda, to erase history. So Kashmir is a dystopian powder keg in a world that is already in flames. The crises in and over Kashmir are at a critical inflection point and not, it's an existential one for the people of that place, for its indigenous people. But it is also one, I think, for the prevailing order and the international community, while deeply complicit, is also seemingly not paying attention. So that's what I wanted to say, and I'm happy to take questions uh, about any of that, uh, if time allows. Thank you. Thank you, Imran, so much for very eloquently drawing our attention to the extremity and the intensity of the struggle in Kashmir, um, and also for letting us know why we need to pay attention to this issue right now. Uh, and, you know, it was very in illuminating to hear the connections to other crises, um, as well as Canada's complicity and the global complicity and, con and contextualizing for that. So thank, thank you very much. Our second speaker of the evening is Malavika Kashturi. Malavika is an associate professor in the Department of History in, at the University of Toronto. She received her PhD um, from the University of Cambridge. She's the author of Embattled Identities, um, Rajput Lineages and the Colonial State in 19th Century Colonial India. She's currently finalizing her book manus manuscript, which is provisionally titled Gurus and Hindutva, Sadhus, Sampraday and Hindu Nationalism in 20th Century India. Welcome Malavika. Um, thank you, uh, thank you, Bianca. Um, very happy to be part of this. Can you all hear me? I hope so. Yes. Um, so um, I'm actually um, not going to be repeating what um, Imran has sort of laid out so eloquently. Um, instead, what I'm going to actually focus on is um, the, um, the the space and place of Kashmir in the Hindu nationalist imagination. And I think that's really important because I want to actually focus um, on the sort of, the, the reasons for the intensification um, of, and of this, this moment of settler colonialism, which has always been part of the, I think, the way in which the um, sort of the, the, uh, the the fascist organization on of which the Bharatiya Janata Party, um, Mr. Narendra Modi's government, um, is actually sort of um, is actually articulating. So that is, I would like to sort of, um, I would like to sort of speak to that, because um, very often the conversations on Kashmir um, uh, have been have drowned out voices. Um, and, 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 and sort of there have been very little space for panels like this. Um, the uh, Kashmir has been sort of, uh, has been put at the heart of other hegemonic nationalist imaginaries, whether it's India uh, as, you know, uh, as, as Kashmir being the, a symbol of uh, a secular nation and whether it is, is for Pakistan as the missing piece, as it were. And these are, these sort of two clashing um, hegemonies have now been replaced by a third. And that is one of a Hindu nationalist party um, that um, in fact is, that has, that, that came to power in India for the first time in, with a full majority in 2014 and with an even sort of, a thumping majority in 2019, which made possible the passing of the, the legislation that Imran spoke about. So um, I'd like to actually sort of bring this to the attention of um, you know everyone, especially in the uh, Canadian audience, because um, the views that um, 
uh, uh, that you know that the Indian government and um, um, a lot of its a lot of think tanks connected to it um, in Canada present India as a robust and thriving democracy, right? Um, actually, which it is not. It is, you know, politely called, it is a an illiberal democracy, and actually, um, it is sort of uh, moving towards what a uh, Hindu rush or a Hindu nation, which was actually fashioned and very much influenced by uh, nationalist socialist models. So, um, you know, the, the uh, and so when India presents itself and, um, you know, Canada and other countries engage with India as a, a democracy, they, um, it is sort of, it is, uh, is silently complicit in turning the other way to um, a, a space which wh uh, where where you have you know this uh, uh, this fascist agenda that's been played out and where the courts have collapsed the uh, the media has collapsed and people have been arrested uh, and put in jails even as we speak on 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 the grounds of sedition and it is in this and there's been a rising uh, islamophobia um, since 2014, it is in this context that we actually have to understand um, what's been happening and what happened in 2019. So I'd like to just, I'd, I'd like to talk about that. And I think it's very, very important, uh, you know, what, Imra, what Imran said, that, you know, when we talk of a democracy, and this is the public face that India is presenting to the world, I think it, it is, I think it is time to question that. Um, and it is, it is tr very, very troubling if, you know, uh, we are at the stage where we're supporting, um, uh, where you're calling a, a country which is ruled by a party, which uh, it was inspired by national socialism. So I'd like to talk about that. And uh, so um, where, what are the antecedents of first of, um, you know, Mr. Modi's government? And um, actually, what is the space and place uh, of Kashmir in this imagination? Um, so, um, uh, uh, and I, I, so I thought, you know, it'd be best if I spoke to that because there are sort of better people than me on this, uh, on this panel to actually talk about, um, you know, uh, uh, Kashmir itself. Um, but what is Hindutva? Hindutva is a sort of Hindu supremacist ideology, right? That first, in fact, emerges um, in 1925. And um, it is, it draws upon um, a text which, in fact, is very much fashioned in the time of fascism, right? In the 1920s and 1930s. So, um, and it is very important to know that the Bharti Janta Party, uh, which is the, uh, which is in power, so uh, when we talk of India, we must understand the India is it's the sort of, you know, India is just a facade. What is behind that facade? Behind that facade is um, a, a political party which is linked to organically and who's uh, and uh, joined sort of a, uh, in its umbilical cord with an organization called the Rashtri Swam Sevak Sang, which calls itself a, a cultural organization, which it is not, but um, which it, it which is actually a um, um, but which is a um, uh, which is uh, which is actually uh, uh, which is a hierarchical, secretive, cultural, and political organization uh, formed in 1925, whose political ideology of Hindutva, which was first enunciated by Veer Savarkar, um, is influenced by fa fascist enunciations of nation and community most notably that of the nationalist socialist experiment in germany who's one of whose chief and uh, the chief one of the chief ideologues of the rss and ms goldwalker is very very open um, in his sort of fascination the really problematic fascination for the same the political community of hindutva is bound together by this understanding of uh, this understanding of hinduness um, that uh, i think we have to kind of uh, understand and um, this uh, Hinduness uh, that unites this community is at once civilizational, cultural, racial, and territorial. Um, the roots of this, according to the RSS, the roots of this ancient Hindu nation that is bound together by common language, Sanskrit, and culture stretches into the mists of time. And this Hindu nation, quote unquote, is given a sp spatial form extending not just to Kashmir and beyond its boundaries to the modern nation states of Nepal, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and well, and into Southeast, uh, Southeast Asia. The RSS demands unfettered love to this spatial geo body. And um, 
and in, and, and most importantly, um, it sort of sees, uh, uh, and most importantly, it sees this sort of, um, uh, this this the, the 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 primary affiliation to be the nation as uh, as as they define it. Um, the most important thing is the is the uh, is the RSS's understanding of when this quote unquote Hindu civilization comes to an end, and this is where I think it's very important to understand and in some sense contextualize its uh, its engagement with Kashmir, which which draws upon a larger Islamophobia, right? Because for the most uh, for the RSS, the most hated other in common with other fascist ideologies is is, is is the hostility towards Muslims. Because from 1200, the specter of Muslim rule is supposed to have unleashed a Hindu genocide, forced conversion and loss of which we have absolutely no proof. More than any external others, including the British, it is Islam which is blamed for the destruction, quote unquote, of Hindu civilization and its greatest of its greatest threat, right? The ideology, uh, the, the, the ideologues of the RSS, the parent organization of the BJP spoke approvingly, very approvingly of German fascist solutions to the perceived internal enemy and in fact celebrated the Holocaust. And uh, this is very, this is, this is the context in which we have to understand the RSS's and the political body's engagement with Hindutva. While the lineaments of Hindutva keep changing in a post-independent India, the precursor of the BJP, the Bharti Jansang, formed in 1951, emphasized their core goals. An examination of all the Jansang's manifestos sees that while it poses as a nationalist party, its goals include its dedication to what it calls Bharatiya culture and um, Akhand Bharat, or a sort of the 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 the, the um, this sort of this imagined Hindu nation that once was, while it scaled back on its demand for the reunification of Akhand Bharat, its demand for the revocation of or, or the complete integration of what it called uh, of of Kashmir into the Indian nation state is something that has remained a constant. Right? From uh, early RSS sponsored agitations from 1946 to 1955 uh, by the BJS and uh, afterwards and and and, it's, and 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 the Bharatiya Janata Party, which replaces the the the, uh, the, uh, the Jansang in 1984, the BJP's manifestos have made the uh, sort of the, the the integration of Kashmir, quote unquote, and settler colonialism a central forum of their manifesto. Um, in uh, complete, uh, this is and this is of course in complete uh, um, distinction while sort of keeping legal regimes and autonomies of other spaces and focusing solely on Kashmir. Um, so um, Kashmir has had a very long and very troubled history of military occupation, which I, which I mean, Imran has spoken to and which I'm not going to talk about. But what is really is significant and what is really important is what happened in 2019 with the imposition, with, with the revocation of um, quote unquote uh, article 370, which gave Kashmir um, autonomy uh, uh, in inverted commas, and in fact uh, reduced it from even whatever status it had um, as an attenuated state and has actually made it into the equivalent of a federal territory. And this was done, um, um, and in fact, even within, if we were to go by the Indian constitution, this is totally unconstitutional because any uh, state uh, or any uh, uh, has to be dissolved by the uh, you know by the by the parliamentary body and uh, of that particular uh, province or state or unit which was not done in this case so um this is after 2019 we have seen the emergence of this new kashmir uh, in which as imran has said um, there are there is actually now only one narrative um, and that narrative is that of the BJP. Um, the only Kashmiris who speak after its occupation have been those Kashmiri pundits who have been weaponized to speak of not just uh, Hindu genocide from the uh, quote unquote, a Hindu genocide that, it's, that, that, that in fact, according to them, stretches back over centuries, right? Uh, to in, uh, which is part of the larger narrative of the RSS. Um, 
And this has been accompanied by the demonizing of Kashmiris, particularly Kashmiri Muslims, um, speaking to the deep hatred that the BJP has towards religious minorities. Um, and um, therefore, Kashmir being, according to the BJP, a Muslim majority state, um, it's the uh, the the kind of the settler colonialism that we see after uh, 2019 August 2019 and the lockdown is celebrated as the taking back of quote unquote Hindu space right and showing Kashmiris how to live in a Hindu Rashtra. It is important for Canadians to actually take note that in fact what this complete uh, uh, you know, uh, sort of, uh, you know, what uh, these human rights atrocities are being celebrated by the BJP. And uh, in fact, it was, it was remarked by the organizer last year. Uh, and the organizer is the official um, publication of the, uh, of the RSS. It praised what it called the bloodless coup um, that had been organized by Mr. Modi and the colonization of, uh, of, of Kashmir. So, and the language that has been used subsequently is that of a victorious colonizer, right? Because the RSS and it's, uh, the BJP and its ecosystem keep celebrating the subjugation and humiliation of Kashmir. Um, it is, it is uh, reiterated again and again as a move that has removed, quote unquote, legal and constitutional uh, apartheid, has integrated Kashmir and, in, uh, and, and made it an integral part of India. And, and what is constantly reiterated is one nation and one constitution and or in the words of member of members of this e ecosystem a move in the path of regaining quote unquote hindu territory inch by inch it presents this move as one that liberates religious minorities in kashmir from the persecution of kashmiris whom it calls jihadis terrorists and many many other things and of course there is a celebration within the right wing ecosystem of the of the ability of indians now to to marry fair skinned kashmiri women buy land and loot resources the language is one of colonialism and humiliation so um it, unsurprisingly in 2020 on the first anniversary of uh, you know the of, of the lockdown um it was celebrated by mr modi by unveiling a temple built over the site of a a, a mosque that was called the barbary masjid that was illegally demolished by his party in 1992 um and uh, in 2019, applying Supreme Court of India passed a judgment recognizing that this demolition was a criminal act, but at the same time, it gave the site back to the quote unquote Hindu site, largely made up of those who were associated with the RSS and the BJP. It is important that Mr. Modi chose 5th August, the first anniversary of this, this next phase of colonialism of Kashmir to inaugurate the new Ram Temple that was celebrated by the diaspora um, in Canada and North America. It was a symbolic and political act showing that back the taking of Hindu space from quote unquote Muslim colonizers in the eyes of the RSS and the BJP. That it was done on uh, when the lockdown began is no coincidence. It was a symbolic marker of the assertion of Hindu supremacy. Why is it important for Canada to know about it? It's because since 2019, the BJP um, and its spokesperson at think tanks abroad have gone on a blitzkrieg of web webinars and publicity events to demonstrate that Kashmir is an internal matter of India. The only voices who get to speak are those of the Hindu right and Kashmiri system and Kashmiri Hindus who are part of this ecosystem. This is an important panel as it actually has voices for Kashmir. The grief, suffering and humiliation of the Kashmiris is celebrated again and again in on in webinars, uh, uh, you know, uh, in uh, by think tanks um, uh, run by the uh, by groups who call themselves Canadian Hindu, uh, Canadian Hindus. And um, in fact, uh, which is in keeping with the escalation of, of uh, Islamophobic rhetoric in India. What remains shocking is that this view is not only propagated by Indian embassies, but in fact is tolerated by Canadians. Um, so uh, it is sort of, so unlike the United States and in Europe where Kashmir actually appears sometimes in the news, along with other excesses of the Modi regime, there is absolutely no news in the Canadian media or amongst politicians from any party about of what is happening in India uh, and more generally, um, and which, uh, which I don't have time to talk about, but which I'd be very happy to talk about in the question answer session, uh, but what made possible the, uh, what happened in 2019.
this immense is if, if is really really important because if canada sees itself as a beacon for human rights this is the time to speak up right while seeming because while seemingly far away from canadian interests this issue is close to home because the rss and bjp have established a number of fronts in canada from where they're spreading their message of hindu supremacism which is uh, which places Kashmir right at the center of the narrative and, and in, in engagement also with white supremacist groups and others. Um, and, these, and these views are supported by prominent organizations on, on which very, very prominent politicians from all parties are speaking. Um, so um, it is very, very important also to realize that many you know, of, of, of the, uh, those who self-identify as the Hindu Canadian diaspora speak out on racism and freedom in Canada and support fascism at home. The silence by Can Canadian politicians is puzzling and it, it appears strategic to invest in India and perhaps to counterbalance China. However, but by doing so, they're actually, and they're, uh, they're propagating and supporting the colonization of Kashmir, Islamophobia, fascism, and endorsing this gross violation of human rights. And play along with the myth that India remains a robust democracy, quote unquote. Silence is complicity, thank you. Thank you, thank you Malavika for your passionate and very clear elaboration on the Hindu nationalist project and also making points that we rarely hear, um, you know, for elaborating on the historical context for today's crisis, the constitutional violations, the settler colonial occupation, the larger context of Islamophobia, the demonization of Kashmiri people. And above all, thank you for reminding us that, you know, Canada has been silent yet it's close to home and that we must, and that we must not remain puzzlingly silent. And um, so I look forward to hearing more from you during the discussion. Our third speaker of the evening is Haley Dushinsky. Haley is Associate Professor of Anthropology and the Director and Graduate Director of, um, uh, Director of the Center of Law, Justice and Culture at Ohio University. She's a legal and, and political anthropologist with research specializations in violence, war and power, law and society and human rights, militarization and impunity in South Asia, especially Kashmir. Among numerous projects, Haley is a founding member of the Critical Kashmir Studies Collective. Her current research focuses on international interventions for human rights and global accountability in Kashmir. Welcome, Haley. Uh, thank you, Bianca. Um, I'd like to just start by saying that um, Kashmir scholars and lawyers emphasize the fact that Kashmir is and has been an international dispute, that the legal and political arrangement in Indian controlled Kashmir must be seen as an instance of colonialism, settler colonialism and illegal occupation rather than a matter internal to India, and that the international dispute must be resolved through a legal and political process carried out in accordance with Kashmiri people's right to self-determination. It's important for us to keep that big picture in mind. Uh, in my comments, I'd like to focus specifically on the human rights situation in Indian-controlled Kashmir over the past 30 years. As the Kashmiri popular movement for self-determination escalated in the late 1980s, the Indian central government sought to crush the armed rebellion through a massive counterinsurgency assault against both insurgent and civilian populations. It declared JNK a disturbed area and deployed from 500,000 to 700,000 military and paramilitary forces in the region. Uh, conserve, even taking a conservative estimate, that's one soldier for every 30 civilians, making it the most heavily militarized zone in the world. Although the armed rebellion effectively faded by the late 1990s and early 2000s, India's counterinsurgency regime has remained in place to the present day, producing a perpetual state of siege that subjects the entire population to everyday conditions of surveillance, punishment, and control. In Kashmir, the movement of Kashmiri civilians is severely restricted on a daily basis through curfews and government shutdowns, as well as an extensive infrastructure of checkpoints, military bunkers, and concertina wires. In this context of intensive and pervasive militarization, Indian military police and paramilitary forces have carried out human rights violations including extrajudicial killings, arbitrary detentions, enforced disappearances, torture, human shields, and sexual assault. International and Kashmiri human rights organizations document that more than 70,000 people have been killed and over 8,000 forcibly disappeared in counterinsurgency operations across this time. And there are around 6,000 unknown and unmarked graves and mass graves in Kashmir. 
In recent years, state armed forces have been deploying pellet firing shotguns as a crowd control technique um, carried out on um, street protesters. These are pump action weapons that contain cartridges uh, with up to 500 tiny ball bearings made of lead that disperse in all directions when fired. In 2016, more than 4,500 people were injured by the use of pellet shotguns. And this includes 1,000 civilians with full or partial eye damage. And this was termed an epidemic of blindness. The police and military operations that produce such pervasive patterns of human rights violations have been uh, facilitated by emergency and national security laws. The military's primary legal instrument of impunity is the Armed Forces Special Powers Act, or AFSPA. This was instituted in 1990, and it remains in place to this day. AFSPA grants military personnel wide powers to arrest, shoot to kill, and occupy or destroy property in counterinsurgency operations, and it grants effective immunity from prosecution for human rights violations. This means that armed forces personnel can kill Kashmiris without any legal accountability, since the military enjoys extensive constitutional powers through AFSPA to kill or maim Kashmiris under the pretext of upholding India's national security. And notably, I just wanna specify that section seven of AFSPA prohibits the prosecution of security force personnel unless the central government, the government of India, grants prior permission or sanction to prosecute. This gives security forces virtual immunity against prosecution. Since the law came into force in Indian controlled Kashmir in 1990, the Indian government has not granted permission to prosecute any security force personnel in civilian courts. So I want to emphasize that no soldier has ever faced trial for a crime against a civilian and much less been convicted of a crime against a civilian. And also that the military has demonstrated a complete failure to provide accountab accountability for these actions. So after decades of absolute denial of justice, we have little faith in these processes today. Now these human rights violations and patterns of impunity have been systematically documented and reported um, by the leading Kashmiri human rights organization, which is called the Jammu and Kashmir Coalition of Civil Society or JKCCS. They've been doing this ground level documentation and reporting work for decades. So I would just encourage any of the audience members here who would like to review this documentation and reporting to visit the website of the Jammu and Kashmir Coalition of Civil Society to learn more about it. International human rights bodies have registered concerns um, about AFSPA and the human rights situation more generally across the past three decades. Um, and here I'm talking about even prior to what we've seen happening at the international level the past uh, year. So, um, you know, we can review um, statements and interventions from the Human Rights Commission, the Human Rights Council, the European Parliament. Issues about the human rights situation in Kashmir and particularly about AFSPA have come up during India's universal periodic reviews at the UN most recently in 2012 and 2017 when various member states have recommended the repeal of AFSPA. And beginning in 2016, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights um, took cognizance of what was happening in Kashmir, especially with reference to the uh, pellet firing shotguns, and requested access for UN monitors, uh, human rights monitors, in both Indian and Pakistan controlled Kash uh, Kashmir. When both countries failed to provide unconditional access, the High Commissioner um, issued two very significant reports on the human rights situation on both sides of the line of control. And these reports came out in 2018 and 2019. In these reports, the High Commissioner called on both countries to fully respect the right to self-determination of the Kashmiri people as respected under international law. Now, the human rights situation um, deteriorated even further at the time of the abrogation in August 2019, as the previous speakers have outlined, when the government of India preemptively curtailed massive popular protest and discontent by imposing a severely repressive siege. The siege included an intensification of the already substantial, uh, substantial troop deployment in the region, um, very restrictive communications blockades, undeclared curfews and travel bans, widespread illegal and arbitrary detentions. Uh, restrictions on the media, on religious belief and practice, torture, the denial of access to justice and legal remedy, the denial of access to health and education, and the dismantling of the rule of law. Uh, the Jammu and Kashmir Coalition of Civil Society provided comprehensive documentation on the human rights situation in Kashmir in the aftermath of the abrogation in its annual 2019 Human Rights Review, and this was published on December 31st of 2019. It also published a substantial report uh, on the communications crackdown specifically that just came out um, in August of 2020. And this report is called Kashmir's Internet Siege, an Ongoing Assault on Digital Rights. 
So these human rights violations, um, I want to emphasize that the human rights violations that we've seen being carried out over the past year, as substantial and significant as they are, they must not be considered outside of their historical, legal, and political context, right? They must not be viewed simply as restrictions that have been instituted on a temporary basis during a period of emergency. But rather, it's critical that as we respond to the situation unfolding in Kashmir that we keep in mind two points. First, the current siege in Kashmir is not a sudden imposition, but rather an intensification and amplification of the techniques of counterinsurgency governance that the Indian state has four decades deployed to manage Kashmiri communities and to cast Kashmiri civilians, especially youth, as suspects and threats. This counterinsurgency governance has operated in and through a dense punishment regime and has institutionalized collective dehumanization, collective punishment, and collective harm against Kashmiris. So what we've seen in the last year is really a, a realization of the full potential of these established techniques of counterinsurgency governance that were already in place, and also the intensification and the amplification of the fear and the terror that they produce. And this takes me to my second point, that these techniques are part and parcel of the massive political and legal transformations underway in Kashmir, which could have, as the previous speakers have outlined, permanent destructive consequences for Kashmiri people. Um, the abrogation has raised new and grave concerns related to sustainable development and economic, social, and cultural rights due to its impact on these key legal protections that supported Kashmiri, um, uh, Kashmiri rights as well as protected Kashmir's fragile Himalayan ecosystem. The abrogation removed legal protections that restricted non-Kashmiris from purchasing land and establishing residency in the region. And therefore, the abrogation now enables massive demographic changes that could make Kashmiris minorities in their own homeland, undermine the territorial attachments that form the basis of Kashmiri ethnic identity, and render inoperable a UN supervised plebiscite to effectuate the will of the Kashmiri people in accordance with the UN Security Council resolutions. So the loss of these legal restrictions has heightened fears among Kashmiris and also among um, um, scholars and experts of ethnic cleansing in Kashmir, which is a crime against humanity. Over the past year, various international actors and bodies have expressed concern about the human rights crisis in Kashmir. Uh, the US Congress has held two hearings, one a subcommittee of the House Committee on Foreign Affairs in October of last year, the other the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission hearing in November of last year. A bipartisan congressional resolution was introduced in the US House of Representatives. In February of 2020, just earlier this year, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres addressed the Kashmir situation during his visit to Pakistan. He reiterated the UN position that the re relevant resolutions of the Security Council on the issue should be implemented. And for effective de-escalation dialogue and another very important condition, full respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms of those in Jammu and Kashmir. In August of 2019, five UN independent experts called on the government of India to end the crackdown on freedom of expression. And they called the communications blackout, quote, a form of collective punishment of the people of Jammu and Kashmir without even a pretext of a precipitating offense. And in her opening statement at the 43rd session of the Human Rights Council, uh, Michelle Bachelet, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, stated, quote, as many as 800 people reportedly remain in detention. This was just in February. As many as 800 people reportedly remain in detention, including political leaders and activists. Schools, businesses, and livelihoods have been disrupted by the continued heavy military presence, and no steps have been taken to address allegations of excessive use of force and other serious human rights violations by security forces. And this was on February 27th of 2020, just a few weeks before the military siege in Kashmir transitioned into a heavily militarized COVID-19 public health lockdown. So I just want to close by emphasizing that the international human rights community is paying attention to the human rights situation in Kashmir. And there are opportunities to carry out significant interventions at this uh, critical historical juncture. It's incredibly important for Canada as a country that promotes human rights and democracy to contribute to that process. Thank you. Thank you, Haley. Thank you so much for helping us to better understand the, the, the just the depth of the human rights um, violations and civilian suffering and death um, as well in Kashmir and, um, and for drawing our attention to the impunity, lack of accountability, lack of justice, um, and, and for helping us to understand the, uh, the trajectory and the amplification of this crisis. And I look very forward to hearing more from you in the discussion. Our next panelist is Sadiq Waid. Uh, 
Sadiq is a scholar in residence at the Center for Public Affairs and Critical Theory at Shiv Nadar University. He received his PhD from Harvard University with a focus on Central Eurasian and Tibetan political history. Sadiq is a member of several academic institutions, including the Central University of Kashmir. He was the founding vice chancellor of the Islamic University of Science and Technology, chair, um, chair professor for modern history, senior visiting fellow at the Center for Policy Research in New Delhi, and director of the UNESCO Mandanjit Singh Institute of Kashmir Studies at the University of Kashmir. He's been an activist in South Asia and internationally on the Kashmir dispute for the last 25 years. Welcome, Sadiq. Thank you, uh, Bianca. And um, I'd like to begin by thanking the um, so Canadian Foreign Policy Institute and Just Peace Advocates. Um, and I think double thanks are necessary because um, Kashmir is these days not on the radar uh, for many reasons, um, much of it having to do with the business of making money, um, sometimes called the economy. Um, and I'd also like to add a personal thanks because I'm from Kashmir, live in Kashmir. Um, and so therefore, you know, it's an opportunity to reach directly um, to the international audience. Um, I, you know, although to, I, I'd like to sort of also add here with a footnote that there are many uh, in Kashmir who can speak uh, for Kashmir, and I hope that uh, they will also be invited in the future. Um, a slight housekeeping sort of issue. I am not uh, with uh, Shivnathar University as of a few days ago uh, for a variety of reasons. So I just, I mean, this is something that uh, I just wanted to clar clarify. Um, my sort of brief is to try and speak to you about the geopolitical environment. Um, and I will try to do so. I realize that um, time is short, so I'll try to paraphrase as, as much as I can. Um, I think to its credit, uh, the Canadian uh, government was one of the first to react uh, to the August 5th, 5th action uh, by the government of India. It reacted with an official statement um, in less than two weeks after August uh, and on August 13th. Um, it notably sort of lauded, uh, laudably um, noted its concerns. And it said that it's feared infringements on civil rights and reports of detentions um, that were happening at that time, the reports. Let me briefly and very briefly mention some and only some of the major violations that have taken place since August 5th um, and continue, most importantly, continue to do to this day. Hundreds of people, including politicians, have been detained across Kashmir. A handful were released a few days ago, but these are ones who don't challenge Delhi at all in terms of the history and the politics uh, of Kashmir. Um, secondly, the resources of the state have been monopolized, something that had not happened uh, until now, with the government of India's help by non-state citizens. Uh, in other words, I mean, the livelihoods uh, of the people of Kashmir have been impaired uh, greatly. Scores of journalists have been harassed, detained, and imprisoned without trial um, in the last year. Um, They've introduced something called the domicile, when they, when I say they, I mean the government of India, of course, um, have introduced something called the domicile rule, very cleverly named because it's not a law and has actually circumvented law, which allows non um, sort of state citizens to buy land and to settle there you know, uh, in, in, um, uh, in Kashmir. In other words, I mean, paving the way for demographic flooding. Um, another thing that has been added, and these are things that are happening every single day, you know. Uh, another thing is that the protocol for forming school curricula for Kashmir, not for Jammu, which is Hindu majority, Jammu being the other province in, in, in the state, um, the protocol, for curricular formation has been diluted, you know, to facilitate the curricular formulation 
by Delhi instead of Kashmir itself, uh, which is in violation of you know the Indian law itself and stuff. And I think I mean uh, this uh, is meant to and will lead to the erasure of history in Kashmir, um, making them or at least hoping to make them a lost um, sort of uh, peoples, you know, without a history. Um, Another thing that has happened is Ladakh and Jammu, uh, who were two provinces, um, you know, in, in the uh, uh, sort of uh, former state of Jammu and Kashmir on this side of the line of control. Um, these two provinces actually celebrated uh, the events uh, on the 5th of August, 2019. Um, and today they have turned hostile to Delhi um, and to the government of India. And they've got, become uh, hostile because their own interests they see have also been eroded in terms of autonomy or any kind of governance. Um, just very recently, a new layer of government has been created to further centralize um, politics and concentrate power um, for all politics in Kashmir. Um, and, and when I say concentrated power, concentrate that power in Delhi, not in uh, now the, the area of uh, Jammu and Kashmir. And finally, Kashmir Times, um, arguably one of the state's oldest newspapers, uh, just a few days ago has been shut down. Um, and its editor, Anuradha Basin Jamwal, uh, who has been personally harassed and maligned publicly um, and clearly with government support. So these are the ways in which, and I think it's important to stress um, is that these are the ways in which Kashmir has been under siege uh, for the last uh, year plus, uh, about four months now. Let me now turn to the geopolitical dimension proper because um, I realized that so far I've listed uh, matters domestic and regional, which you know, uh, is important. Many have done very competently already, um, and I thank them for it, the passion and the, uh, you know, due diligence that has been done on that. Um, but here, too, the Canadian government expressed the following concerns um, in its statement of August 13th, 2020, um, I mean, 2019, about the situation in South Asia, which incidentally is home to two billion peoples. I just wanted to let you know if you throw in uh, Bangladesh, uh, Pakistan, um, and Nepal, and, and uh, the other countries in the region. Um, the Canadian government said, and I quote, it feared the risk of military escalation. And I'd just like to say that there has been very significant military um, escalation, not so much with Pakistan, although that has happened too, but with China. Uh, because in uh, May, on, on May 5th, uh, 2020, uh, for the first time in 50 years, the People's Liberation Army and the Indian Army fought in a hand-to-hand -hand brutal combat um, in which 20 Indian soldiers were killed. Um, and we don't know about the, uh, the number of Chinese casualties, uh, you know, or, or the casualties on the Chinese side. Um, and uh, India has accused China of encroaching, China has denied it and counter accused India. And uh, what most of the world uh, does not know is that this too, I mean, the territory over which China and India are fighting today now uh, is JNK territory and has been disputed since the 1950s. Um, and so therefore, I mean, you have to include a third party in this dispute. Uh, which means China. Uh, not to say that China hasn't been there, it has always been there, but it has been sort of muted, so to speak. Um, you know, and, and now it has arisen largely because, and this is important, of the August 5th action, because it directly affected the China-Pakistan economic corridor, um, where uh, China has invested huge amounts. So in other words, China's material interest, because of this unresolved problem, um, has been endangered, you know, according, according to the Chinese. Um, and so therefore, we throw in another party in, into the, uh, to uh, actively throw in another party into the dispute. Um, and the other thing that the Canadian government was worried about is that all parties, meaning I think 
to this, in this instance, India and, and Pakistan need to maintain peace and stability. I'm quoting from, from the release. Um, and I can assure you that the, there has been neither peace nor stability between the two countries. And in fact, uh, as uh, recently as a couple of days ago, um, a BJP, which is a ruling party uh, member of, of uh, a member of the BJP in, the, in Kashmir or Jammu, um, actually was advocating war against China to take back um, the uh, sort of uh, part of Kashmir that is now on the other side of the line of control uh, in uh, administered by Pakistan. Um, so again, you know, sort of the, the I think the lines of, of um, uh, sort of violence are, are heating up, you know, uh, here. The other thing that uh, the Canadian government urged was, quote, meaningful discussions with affected communities. Um, and I would imagine that affected communities is a euphemism for the people of JNK, you know, because they are the first uh, to be affected. And again, there have been no discussions and the government of India has overtly said that they are not interested in talking to resistance leaders or even dissenters. Um, and that at, uh, you know, at any point about uh, the Kashmir problem. Um, so there is a stonewalling, um, which I think is only builds up the pressure. So Canada has done good to show concern but the statement is over a year old and nothing has substituted it. So I think that it is time for um, Canada uh, to, to um, uh, make more statements because all its fears about what could have happened have happened or what could happen have happened. The most worrisome dimension of the current instability between China and India is that it has involved the United States, thereby creating a new Cold War. Two characteristics of this are, um, you know, uh, sort of uh, are something that I'd like to mention very briefly. One, there's an emerging active rivalry between China and India, um, and this is between the two states, uh, China and India, who believe in their respective civilizations as being, um, a, a, a civil, uh, sorry, um, who believe in their respective civilizational superiority um, and, and they see themselves as majority communities seeking to homogenize uh, those living within their borders and consolidate hegemony over their territories. Um, now, I, I just would like you to, to think briefly about what the implications of this are, you know. Um, and uh, it, it's not, I mean, you know, when, when you have two states with that ideology in mind, um, in addition to being authoritarian, as you've already heard, uh, in addition to India also being authoritarian, you know. Um, number two is that the, there has now formed a, a, a sort of alliance, uh, shall we say, between India and the United States and Pakistan and China, which is very similar to the old Cold War sort of scenario. Um, but except that in this case, the theater of operation is South Asia, not Europe. And I think that that is something because the, the size of the humanity uh, that this includes over, you know, uh, sort of uh, uh, 2 billion uh, people is something um, that you must uh, contemplate and see what it means in terms of impact uh, worldwide, not just uh, within India. Um, secondly, compared to the Cold War, um, it, it, I mean, when we compare it to the Cold War, it makes it a little like combining North and South Korea divide on the one hand and the pre-1991 East Germany, West Germany divide on the other hand and enlarging the clashes of identities in Yugoslavia by a hundredfold, literally with similar clashes potentially coming out all over South Asia. Not a very happy situation 
uh, to contemplate is what I'd like to see. The most visible optics of this emerging scenario is the third point I'd like to make is that is the planned naval exercise that is to be held literally in another four days amongst the United States, Japan, India, and Australia to quote, send a signal to China as one Indian newspaper put it, uh, a signal of muscle, obviously, uh, to China. Um, again, I mean, I, I, the point here being that it threatens global peace, uh, world peace. Um, and I'd like to sort of quickly point out that it is something that has started uh, with great intensity after August 5th. Um, so what do we have? You have a bilateral hot regional rivalry, India-Pakistan, and a multilateral Cold War, you know, um, which pits two of the world's most populous states whose combined population totals almost 3 billion people, 2.7 billion people. Um, and two, the two states have, India and Pakistan I'm referring to, have between them the entire length of the Himalaya a mountain system, which is known as the third pole because of its you know, uh, significance for climate, has dramatic implications for both climate and water supply for a huge swath of uh, humanity, not to mention a populational uniqueness and diversity unrivaled in the world when we talk about the length of the Himalaya. And let us not forget that in this theater of operations, three of the states involved, China, India, and Pakistan, all claim the territories of JNK as their own, and that all of them have nuclear weapons. I mean, this is something that you really have to contemplate. I mean, Noam Chomsky just said that the world has entered a, a, a danger, extremely dangerous phase. Um, and I really must uh, emphasize that we feel it the most uh, on the ground and in a very real way here uh, in Jammu and Kashmir. Um, I mean, you know, and, and uh, those of you are familiar with uh, uh, sort of the Kashmir situation or more familiar with the Kashmir situation, we know that that violence between states has been ratcheted up in the last uh, two years, uh, at least three or four times. You know, and I think that this is something, it's a fearsome scenario, uh, no matter which way uh, you look at it. So let me conclude by saying that it is not a scenario in which Canada and the world in general should remain silent in the interests of corporate private capital known as economy. You know, the government of uh, Canada, as I said, has not spoken for a year about Kashmir now. It is time. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, uh, Sadiq. Despite your um, 2G access, I could hear, hear you great and see you great, and I hope the audience could as well. Um, thank, you. thank you so much for just the insightful geopolitical perspective and its relationship to global peace. And we can, just, we can only hope that politicians are listening. Um, and someone just noted in the chat, and I thought I would bring it up, that you know, there is repression and silencing for those who speak out. Uh, on these issues. So just particular gratitude to you and, this, and, and all the speakers and to you for your decades of outspoken activism uh, on the issue. Um, so our, uh, our final speaker of the evening is uh, Aziza Kanji. Aziza is a legal academic and writer. She received her Juris Doctor from the University of Toronto's Faculty of Law and Masters of Law specializing in Islamic Law from the School of Oriental and African Studies, the University of London. Aziza's work focuses on issues relating to racism, law, and social justice. Her writing has appeared regularly in Canadian and international media, including Al Jazeera, English, the Toronto Star, the National Post, Ottawa Citizen, Truthout, and various academic anthologies and journals. Welcome, Aziza. Thank you, Bianca. Good evening, everyone. Salam. Greetings of peace. I want to begin by thanking profoundly the organizers at this event and my fellow panelists whose work I so deeply admire and who I've continued to learn from tonight. And thank you also to all of you who are tuning in um, to this conversation. 
I know we are competing with some other events tonight, including the spectacle of the US uh, presidential debate. So thank you for tuning in to this conversation about the structural atrocity that continues to exist in Kashmir, ongoing behind the usual um, political circus of things like the US presidential election. I also want to begin by acknowledging that we are having this conversation about the colonization of Kashmir on land that is colonized indigenous territory. And I want to extend my solidarity and encourage all of you also to support the indigenous land and water defenders on this land who are currently being criminalized and harassed and assaulted by white supremacists from the Mi'kmaq fishers uh, to the Wet'suwet'en who are facing down a colonial pipeline, to the Haudenosaunee uh, at 1492 Land Back Lane, some of whom were in court just this morning facing down the colonial legal system that continues to criminalize them. It is clear from everything that we have heard tonight about the central Indian government's policies in Kashmir, the deliberate demographic flooding through changes to the domicile rule, the rapacious gobbling up of lands, forest, and rivers, the efforts to overwrite Kashmiri history. It is clear from all of this that what we are seeing in Kashmir is not simply a consistent pattern of human rights atrocities and crimes against humanity, although it certainly is that, but it is rather a concerted project of settler colonization that is being permitted to be perpetuated in plain sight of an international order that constantly claims to be post-colonial and yet persistently looks away as colonial projects continue to unfold. From Canada to Palestine to Kashmir, at the very heart of all projects of settler colonialism is the logic of erasure what the eminent scholar of settler colonialism called the elimination of the native, which means that the question of genocide is never far from the issue of settler colonization. When it comes to erasure, we see there is the primary erasure, the attempts to eradicate indigenous peoples as independent political, social, and cultural people, which is attempted to be affected by the types of violence we see common across various different settler colonial contexts, the extrajudicial killings, the tortures, the rapes. Then there is the secondary erasure, the attempts to silence those who dare talk about these atrocities. And then there is even a tertiary level of erasure in which there is an attempt to silence anyone who even talks about the silencing as we also see in the context of Israel and Palestine. And so while we constantly hear this refrain when it comes to Kashmir and other colonial situations that we need to be a voice for the voiceless, we even heard this earlier, earlier tonight, we know that there is no such thing as the voiceless. This myth of voicelessness is yet another ideology that perpetuates the erasure of the colonized because there is no such thing as the voiceless, only as the novelist Arundhati Roy remarked, those who are deliberately silenced or preferably unheard. And so when it comes to settler colonization, we see the colonized are subjected to multiple levels of erasure, erasure upon erasure upon erasure. Within Kashmir itself, this has been manifest in the ongoing attacks on journalists, including, as Sadiq mentioned just a few days ago, the attacks on the offices of the Kashmir Times and their editor. And within Canada, there is the ongoing silence of the government and politicians about what is happening in Kashmir, and not simply passive silence, but active silence, so that Canadian representatives were among the participants in a propaganda tour that was recently staged by the Indian government in February 2020 in order to show how normal the situation in Kashmir has now become. As we know, Canadian politicians have also been perpetual participants in similar propaganda tours staged in Israel. And so that even just this January, despite the statements of concern that the Canadian government had previously released about the situation in Kashmir, Canada's high commissioner in Kashmir said that many of the issues that were raised had largely been addressed. 
Canadian media has also been an aider and a better of this silencing. We know, for example, that when Justin Trudeau went on his diplomatic trip to India in 2017, most of the coverage in Canadian media was fixated on the Justin Trudeau's wardrobe choices while they completely ignored the skeletons in Modi's closet. And their main um, question was why Modi had not hugged Justin Trudeau at the airport as he had previously hugged Benjamin Netanyahu, seeking the embrace of a man who is known as the butcher of Gujarat and who should now also be known as the strangler of Kashmir. In our Canadian discourse regarding the Canada-India relationship, we persistently hear this refrain that Canada and India are ideologically united by their commitments to human rights, pluralism, and democracy. And this is repeated over and over again, not only by politicians and government representatives, but also in op-eds across the political spectrum. For example, in one published just a few days ago in the Toronto Star, which supposedly adheres to progressive social justice principles. Like all propaganda, or all of the best, pro like all of the best propaganda, this idea that Canada and India are ideologically bound to each other does contain some element of truth. As fellow settler colonial states, Canada and India are certainly ideologically connected to one another. They are connected by the ideology of exploitative extractivism, mining, premised on the continuing dispossession and subjugation of Indigenous nations. So that Canada salivates at the prospect of increased profits from the escalating export of uranium to India, uranium obtained through the poisoning of indigenous nations and lands. While Canadian mining companies historically have been involved in mining projects that have been complicit in atrocities committed against Adivasi indigenous communities in India, while Indian companies such as Tata and Indian Oil are invested in steel mines and liquefied natural gas projects that in Canada are premised on exacerbating the dispossession and denial of sovereignty of Indigenous nations from Labrador to British Columbia. Canada and India are united by the ideology of privatization for corporate profit so that prominent Canadian corporations like Bombardier are now assertively seeking to reap the profits of India's privatization of its national railway system. And they are united by the ideologies of militarism and a racist war on terror. So that Canada openly advertises its desire to feed a bigger share of the rapacious Indian appetite for military equipment. India being one of the largest importers of arms in the world and Canada being one of the largest exporters of what it euphemistically refers to as defense projects, defense products which Canada's defense minister Harjit Sajjan boasts to, boasts to India has been battle tested as if it is a point of pride that Canada's weaponry has been used not only on indigenous people and black people confronted by militarized police in Canada, but also all of those populations subject to Canada's imperial interventions abroad. Apparently, Canada's shame that Canadian nuclear reactors were deployed in India's testing of nuclear weapons several decades ago has evaporated, relegated to the dustbin of history so that now Canada anxiously chomps at the bit to supply India, uh, the Indian regime with arms for its atrocities. It is also worth noting that under even the new terms of Canada's arms control regime, since Canada uh, has finally acceded to the International Armed Trades Treaty, even under this revamped regime, the end user of Canadian defense products are not, are not automatically tracked. It is only the state that directly receives the, these products and then may incorporate them into a weapon and then trade them on to further states. So it is not only India's atrocities that Canada is arming, but also potentially 
those of regimes like the one in Myanmar that Canada has explicitly accused of committing genocide against the Rohingya people, India having been identified as a primary supplier of arms to the genocidal Myanmar regime. While these cooperations of state militarism are, are sanitized and obscured, the resistance of the colonized continues to be demonized. In the most recent statement, for example, of the Canada-India Working Group on Counterterrorism, the attack in Polwana, Kashmir by, uh, is condemned as a quote unquote terrorist attack even though terrorism is defined as violence against civilians while this was an attack on security forces. Indeed, we have seen in Canada how charitable organizations have been stripped of their charitable status for donations made to humanitarian organizations in Kashmir on the speculation that some of their funds may have third hand through several degrees of separation ultimately perhaps maybe may have ended up in the coffers of an organization listed as a terrorist entity. So we have the stripping of organizations of their charitable status for donations to Kashmir, while on the other hand, the charitable arm of the RSS, the Hindu Swayam Sebak Sang, which Malavika are, so eloquently described the ideology of the RSS, this has been permitted to have its charitable status since 1991. And we see similar kinds of disparities in other colonial situations. For example, the preservation of charitable status for organizations advancing the settler project in Palestine by Israel. It is notable that in the Canada Revenue Agency's notice of revocation for this organization for donating to Kashmir, the word occupation is written in quotation marks, occupation, as if this is just a perception of the organization being impugned. As a lawyer, I don't know what else you call it when you have 700,000 soldiers in a territory in order to address the supposed threat posed by according to what India's own numbers is 200 militants. I don't know, maybe we could just call it counterterrorism. This complicity and silence from the government and its subservience to corporate and militaristic interests is shameful, but it is not surprising. However, as Kashmiri scholar Dr. Hafsa Kanjwal has pointed out, this silence on Kashmir extends far beyond uh, centrist or right parties and far beyond government and extends to many sections of the left and liberal groups. For example, it is telling that in both of the NDP and um, Green, the two more left-wing parties in Canada, in both of their statements in Kashmir, neither even mentions the issue of Kashmiri self-determination. They focus on human rights violations while completely ignoring the central issue, the central violation, the source of all violations that Kashmiri's right to self-determination has been deprived, even though self-determination under international law is considered of such central importance that it is a right erga omnes, meaning that it is a right that not only the violators, but all states and all parties are bound to, to respect and to honor. As Professor Kanjwal points out, this reluctance across the spectrum to stand for Kashmiri self-determination is tied to deeply seated Islamophobic ideas that persistently render the idea of Muslim self-determination a threat due to deeply Islamophobic stereotypes about Muslim extremism and violence and misogyny. We see how widespread these ideas are and deeply entrenched these ideas are across the political spectrum so that even just a few days ago, NDP MP Randall Garrison cited such ideas in a panel on anti-militarism in order to justify the Canadian intervention in Afghanistan. <laughs> 
we know that the most powerful of oppressive ideas are not those that are the subject of contention between the right and the left, but precisely those which are so agreed upon by the right and the left that they largely appear normalized and take it for granted. And so the silence on Kashmir is a product of these transpartisan normalization of ideologies of Islamophobia and settler colonization. I want to end quickly by saying that this may appear hopeless, this conglomeration of powerful forces that we are facing when it comes to working for justice for Kashmir in Canada. But we know even when it has come to other situations that are now considered atrocities, such as apartheid in South Africa, the Canadian government, which now claims it was against apartheid all along for many, many decades, supported the apartheid regime and criminalized and surveilled those in Canada who dared to oppose it. It often seems like nothing can ch ever change until everything changes and then everyone pretends they were on the right side of history all along. And so there are many actions that you can take, including going to the Justice for All website in order to send a letter to your MP about the situation in Kashmir and urging them to uphold the fundamental right of self-determination for Kashmiris, because it is our job, it is our work to create a situation, to create a climate where the current complicity with the atrocities in Kashmir becomes untenable. Salam, greetings of peace. Thank you, and I look forward to the discussion. Well, thank you so much, Aziza, for your strong, strong presentation, for highlighting the contradictions, the deep contradictions and hypocrisies of Canada's foreign policy um, and our international responsibility. Um, the unifying ideologies from militarism to corporatism, um, the treatment of indigenous people. Thank you for, for, for bringing up and highlighting um, you know, our, our recent panel as well and, um, and the ways in which war uh, you know, ha ha can and is justified by those on the left and on the right. Um, so thank you again. Thank you for grounding this in indigenous struggles which are so connected to the struggles in Kashmir um, and for you know, just this call to end the normalization, to stand up for Kashmir and the right, right to self-determination. And I really, I really take to heart the hopeful message that things can change very quickly um, and that history has shown us that. So um, this uh, brings us to the end of uh, the first part of our evening. Thank you to your, the speakers for your tremendous opening statements. Um, this evening has already been quite remarkable. Um, we're moving into the second part of our evening um, where the, the panelists are going to have a bit of an opportunity to reflect on what they've heard from other panelists. So now we're in the Q&A period and the first part of that um, is going to be a section where I, I'm posing two panelists that after having heard from each other um, and, and having an opportunity to reflect, are there any questions or comments that you have for for any of the other panelists. And I encourage, I encourage uh, someone to just jump right in. I'll, I'll say, I'd just like to yield my time to the general q and I don't have any, I don't have any questions. Okay. I'd just like to say that Aziza has actually um, has explained beautifully why Canada is complicit. Thank you. All right, if we have, um, if we have, if we have no more questions from panelists to other panelists, then we'll just dive right into the questions from the audience, because there's, there's actually quite a few of them. Um, so the first question that we have um, is actually directed at, uh, at Imran, um, and someone from the audience says, please talk about Kashmir and Palestine and what's been happening over the last 70 plus years and currently. Yeah, so this is a huge question and I'm not gonna try to respond to all of it, but let me just say a few things. So there are parallels between the experience that we see 
um, or the people of Kashmir and the people of Palestine, there are differences as well. They come out obviously of a very uh, related, interlinked colonial history as it relates to the United Kingdom and its activities. It's actually very interesting if you kind of dig into the political history of the formation of the UN and the UK's role, the way that the UK foreign office was dealing in, in the two places is um, they were thinking about what they were doing. Although that's not necessarily apparent to all of us, but what's happened in Kashmir, like Palestine, um, occupation, colonization, etc. cetera. Um, the two states, India and Israel have collaborated very closely for a number of years. It's not, it's not a recent thing. This is going back decades. And I think Haley very, very articulately described this sort of counter, counterinsurgency state um, in, uh, in Kashmir. And all along, Israeli advisors have worked with the Indians to help them you know, formulate their policies and perfect their techniques, et cetera. And similarly, the Indians have gone to Israel and trained, et cetera. It's still happening today. And I think one of the points here is that there is this, you know, best practices, if you will, of colonial domination. I mean, these states, they actually work together. And what's interesting is that, uh, you know, Sadiq Sab mentioned, you know, for example, the difference between China and India, when it comes to repression, they do, they do tend to sort of learn from and borrow from each other. So for example, you know, there's a, the phenomenon of facial surveillance as part of an overall regime of total surveillance was something that has gone to an extreme level in a place like East Turkestan or Xinjiang. The same companies that supply the Chinese, there's the Chinese state-owned companies, they supply the Indian military in Kashmir. I mean, there's, there is a sort of collaboration in best practices. Question is about Israel. So there are similarities, there's collaboration. There's obviously, and Malavika talked about this, you know, think about the ideology of Zionism and that of Hindutva, they are not only, they're not only very close parallels, they actually recognize in each other their, um, you know, they're very simpatico, I don't know what the right word is, but they, they basically get along very well. They, they recognize in each other that they are fellow travelers and allies. Um, let me say one other thing. Uh, there's a recent normalization, I'm sure most people are aware of relations uh, between the UAE and Israel. And I, I raise that here because the UAE is extremely close to India as well. So for example, in the context of the fall of 2019, at the same time that India was carrying out the this sort of campaign of violations that we were talking about in Kashmir, the UAE gave Narendra Modi, who as was mentioned, is a he's a genocide, basically. They gave him their highest civilian honor as a sort of a sign of their friendship, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. These states work closely together. And the UAE, I mean, it's kind of has an outside importance in the violations that are happening in Yemen, happening in Libya, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you see this, it's very interesting to sort of see the commonality, common interest, fellow traveling amongst these states. There are differences as well. So let me give you an example. There were some questions about um, the settler colonial campaign in Israel as opposed to uh, uh, India's. And what's interesting about in the case of Israel is that, um, at least in my understanding, the Israelis were in some, in some ways very cognizant of international humanitarian law, at least in the beginnings of their project. They tried to sort of focus on um, building out around military installations, given certain doctrines in international humanitarian law, their occupation. And they've always sort of, they've been gradualistic about it and they try to legalize it step by step, et cetera. And they've been very cognizant of world opinion. You know, they use the United States primarily and other states as their cover. What's different in India, a part of what's different in India is that while you have the same, uh, you know, beginnings around military installations, the same is true. There's 400 square kilometers of territory that's been held by the military illegally for, for, for a long time. Um, there isn't the same recognition or consideration of international law or, or what anyone in the world thinks because this all happens in total, a total vacuum. There's no one paying attention. And so the tendency is that it's much more aggressive in India and it has, there's no compunction about it really. And this is actually, I mean, we talked a little bit about, you know, this, what, what feels like ancient history, but it's not. 1947, the partition of South Asia, when India and Pakistan are created, at the same time, in basically in September to November of, of 1947, there is a genocide carried out by the RSS, the organization that Malavika talked about, together with the troops of the 
I called them this, uh, this warlord regime. Their troops, they sort of collaborate in enterprise of a genocide in the province of Jammu that Sadiq mentioned. And that was a wholesale erasure of the people. It's more like what the U.S. did, and I guess maybe Canada as well, to the indigenous people of the U.S. and less like what the Israelis have done to the Palestinians, in my understanding. So there are, there are similarities, there is collaboration, there are differences. And I think in our advocacy, I would just say that we have to be attentive to both the similarities and the differences and try and be as uh, robust as possible in our advocacy and in, in trying to actually improve the situation that we seek to improve. I hope that's responsive. Thank you so much, Imran. The next question that we have is from Malavika. The question is, can you please further elaborate on the rise of Hindu supremacist organizations in Canada that promote the BJP narrative on Kashmir? Uh, thank you for that question. Um, and it's one that's very close to my heart. And I actually believe um, there are a lot of us working um, on this issue. Uh, and um, actually there are, and, and I, I just like to sort of say that the, um, the RSS has a number of affi affiliate groups and it sort of, uh, it, it, it proliferates and takes different forms and they're very, they're like chameleons. And what is sort of really in uh, interesting is that there is an official international wing of the um, of the RSS, which uh, is present both in uh, different parts of Europe and the United States, and in fact in um, in, um, in 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 Canada. What is uh, even more troubling is that the international wing of the RSS has. Hindu student councils on all university campuses, including the University of Toronto, right? And all the three campuses, and um, not just in and not just in Ontario. In addition um, to the uh, to this, um, what we also have to kind of understand is that, in fact, most of the consulate offices in Canada um, actually function. It's very interesting. They function openly in in Toronto and other uh, in Ottawa with these groups, many of whom have been outed as um, you know as sort of either getting funding from the RSS. They call themselves charitable organizations. They call themselves um, you know sort of. Uh, I don't want to take any specific names here, but you know they 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 basically they they they, they see themselves. They call they have these names which seek to facilitate uh, what they say. What they say is platform and commerce uh, between India and Canada, or they call themselves heritage organizations and sort of use the slippery and problematic language of multiculturalism, right, to promote um, things like Hindu Heritage Month, etc. Which you know is something that you and we and, and we need to be asking um, and sort of why these organizations are calling themselves charitable, charitable organizations, why they are holding webinars that spread hate speech and in fact propagate ideas and and talks by, um, you know, uh, by the, uh, would spin the RSS narrative on Kashmir in Canada and why Canadian politicians in fact engage with them um, openly, uh, because I think, uh, you know, as more, Aziza says, they know. Um, so I think in fact, they're extremely widespread. Um, they are sort of very open about it. Um, and in fact, they are, it's just like, uh, you know, people sort of say, um, how come we didn't know that this was happening? Well, you know, a weed grows not just in your back backyard, but right in front of you and you choose not to see it. Um, and the interesting and thing that I can say is that, you know, the number of times that, um, uh, uh, that those who are interested in this issue and who've actually been sort of speaking and trying to speak have actually found absolutely no interest at all from the Canadian media. So, uh, and this is something which I find quite shocking because this is something that should be written about. Um, this is something that should be, it's a, it's a Canadian issue as well. Um, if you can write about, if we are talking about sort of different forms of, of white supremacy, um, Islamophobia, we need to be talking about this as well. And we should not be worried about what ethnic vote banks. We need to be calling out those who are speaking 
um, the language of hate um, and sort of trying to blend it with hegemonic, um, you know, sort of um, state narratives. And um, these charitable organizations and so on can be called out. There are laws in Canada. The thing is, who will, it is not, the, it, it is not something that one person alone can do. Um, then there need to be a lot of people who are interested and we need, uh, and there has to be a public support for, for this. And I, and I and actually believe if the, if the Canadian media actually chose to write about it, I think there would be, um, you know, the, the spotlight would be put on these groups. In fact, I think such groups should be banned from campuses to start with, because uh, these are groups which are also Holocaust deniers. That should be a big problem. Um, and, but they speak the language of race, of, of, of multiculturalism. They speak the language, interestingly, of indigeneity. Um, and they also speak the language of faith and sort of are the first to cry and out about racism. I'm not saying that's, that's wrong. However, um, the problem is that this then, um, the, I, because of the slippery multicultural model, Hindutva actually passes under the guise of Hindu heritage. And unfortunately, this is very often, it worms its way into the TDSB, into the school boards. Um, and, and, and they don't know what they are actually celebrating. So I think it's very important that this insidious and very vitiating and very poisonous discord be identified for what it is because it is being normalized in Canada. Thank you. Thank may, you. I just, may I just also say thank you so much, Malavika, for that, for that exposition of what's being allowed to go on under everyone's noses in Canada. We also know that these Hindutva far-right groups have very strong connections with pro-Israel militant Zionists as well as white supremacist groups. And that, for example, pro-Israel groups, which claim to be fighting against the anti-Semitism of those who are standing up for a Palestinian's most basic rights, that they continue to form relationships with Hindutva groups, even though, as we know, their ideology is based on Nazism and many of them are Holocaust deniers. And so for anyone who is also interested in, in addressing the, the, the presence of these other very pernicious forces that are shutting down some of the most basic debates in Canada, it's also important to look at their relationship with these um, Hindu far-right groups. Thank you so much, Aziza. So the next question that we have is for Haley. Um, have any Indian armed forces to date been held to account? Well, yeah, that's a critically important question. Um, and. The answer is unfortunately no. I mean, because of this um, provision of AFSPA, um, the central government is required to provide sanction before any armed forces security personnel can be, um, can be charged uh, for human rights violations for any kind of action carried out under AFSPA in J and K. And so that has not happened. So there have been you know, no trials for any um, armed forces personnel and no convictions, certainly. Um, you know, and it's important to emphasize that uh, AFSPA, the, the, the way that uh, the central government interprets AFSPA, right, is that it applies to all actions carried out by armed forces personnel who are operating in the region. Um, and it gives really, really wide berth, right? So in the kind of subjective perception of the personnel member of, of of almost any rank and file at that particular moment, if they feel that their actions are necessary to maintain law and order, then, um, I mean, that's the key issue, right? And so this has been interpreted to apply not only to extrajudicial killings and uh, torture, uh, but also to violations including sexual violence, right? Which wouldn't seem to be the kinds of military actions, um, you know, that would be covered by AFSPA. And yet it's been applied with such in, in such a wide way that it's provided complete in, impunity to security force personnel. Um, there's been a case that um, there's been a case uh, unfolding recently in Kashmir that kind of demonstrates how this plays out in practice. Right. So in July, just a couple of months ago, um, three um, three civilian laborers left their home village and went out looking for work. Um, their families didn't hear back from them. So for a couple of days, they thought maybe they had been held in quarantine. Um, then it came out that the army made an announcement that they had killed uh, three 
militants in an encounter, killing, kind of retaliatory gunfire episode, and um, you know presented this kind of framing publicly. So um, the families um, came out and highlighted. Um, they supplied photographs of their family members who were who were missing, and this traveled on social media. And so it seemed that the three individuals who had been uh, announced to have been killed by the uh, by the army soldiers were most likely these individual civilian laborers. So the police announced that they would conduct an investigation and the army announced that they would carry out a probe and they did carry out a probe. They carried out a probe over four weeks. And in September, they came out and said that they had concluded through the probe. I mean, they, um, they um, um, exhumed the bodies, they did DNA tests, they reburied the bodies. And they said that based on a kind of a, they had prima, prima facie evidence that these were indeed the three civilians. And they said that they would then be proceeding, and this was just last month, they said that they would proceed through military channels to ensure that there was some kind of um, accountability for the soldiers who were involved in this case. So, I mean, that, you know, at, at, at a surface level, that would provide a kind of impression that there is some kind of active accountability for soldiers who carry out these violations, if not in the judicial system, then perhaps in, um, you know, the military uh, justice system. But after seeing so many decades, right, of a complete impunity for human rights violations, um, we've become very kind of skeptical, skeptical about the possibilities for justice. And we've actually seen this before, right? So in November of 2014, um, in a different fake encounter case, a similar case, fake encounter case, uh, the army reported in 2014 that a military court had sentenced five soldiers. And this included two officers. They said, we've sentenced these soldiers to life in prison for faking an armed encounter in which three innocent vill uh, villagers were killed. And this was a really high profile fake encounter from 2010. So this was then held out as one instance where there had been a form of justice through the military system and that these five soldiers would have life sentences, right? But then just a few years later in July of 2017, a military tribunal suspended the punishment for all five of these soldiers. And so once again, like this just kind of solidified this idea that there is complete and blanket impunity for armed forces personnel who are carrying out these violations. Thank you so much, Haley. So we only have time for about uh, two more questions. Um, we're already quite over. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna take one question here that has been posed to Sadiq. What role can China play in peace in the region? Uh, <clears throat> really, I mean, you know, it depends on what kind of peace um, that we're talking about because China itself, of course, we all know has a situation in Eastern Turkestan, it has a thing. But one of the things that, um, is encouraging for Kashmir is that China uh, holds um, a substantial portion of JNK territory. And so they become party to the dispute. Um, and when they become party to the dispute, then there's a habit uh, of everybody sort of listening when China is in the room or at the table, you know, and so, um, I think that that is something um, that um, can, you know, sort of see, you have to understand that thus far Delhi denies that there is a dispute at all, you know, and so now uh, it has been forced to recognize uh, that there is one um, and not in small proportion by what happened uh, in, in the last four or five months um, along the border with China. Uh, which is actually JNK state territory um, that China is sitting on. So I think that that's it, but it is not without its own complications because you have, you know, sort of human rights violations, which are not small <laughs> on the part of, of China itself. Um, and also, you know, business relations between India and China uh, that, that there exist. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, the rivalry between China um, and India today um, is is maybe a, a factor that will again pull in discussion on the GNK uh, dispute um, in into the picture. So I think that that's um, you know uh, how China can help. 
um, you know, in the thing. I, I don't know what it holds. See, one of the things that we have to look at is the various movements or various struggles that peoples have uh, against states um, is that there's an emerging sort of pattern of peoples rebelling against states. You know, and that I think that that crescendo needs to pick up, and and China is no exception to that rule. Um, and at the moment, of course, it's it's um, very difficult in China for people. You know, so I don't know whether that answers the question, but, but it's a complex one. Thank you, thank you. And the final question is for Aziza, and the question is: um, Do you think existing MPs in Parliament are already in the Indian lobby's court? Or do you think that MPs are fertile ground to be spoken to? So I don't know what goes on behind the privileged doors of MPs offices. We know that there are very significant lobbying efforts going on and extreme amounts of pressure that are being applied by the forces that Malavika has outlined. I know personally, for example, that when writing articles about these issues, uh, when I was a journalist at the Toronto Star, I continued to receive racist hate mail for months afterwards, comparable only to the backlash received when writing about Israel and Palestine. And we know how effective those forces have been in shutting down any kind of critical conversation around Canada's uh, policy towards Palestinians, even when it comes to just upholding, again, what are the most basic fundamental principles of um, international law. Um, so I can only imagine that there are similar levels of, of pressure being applied, not to mention all of the different types of um, investments and incentives for Canada not to take a strong um, position against India on Kashmir. And of course, this goes back for decades. But I think there does come a point when the public can create such pressure that it no longer becomes possible for the government to ignore the issue. And then our task is to make sure that the government doesn't simply engage in these types of lip service um, exercises that often have far more to do with either preserving the public image of the government or advancing its real politic goals, as we see, for example, with the co-optation among some sectors of uh, Canadian right politicians of the Uyghur genocide in order to advance its anti-China agenda in a way that has little to do with checking the Canadian uh, and other corporate interests and surveillance technology, for example, that are also implicated in the, uh, or mining that are also implicated in the ongoing genocide in East Turkestan against the Uyghurs. And so in addition to, um, to communicating with MPs, I think we also need to do the work as civil society of exposing points of Canadian complicity with the atrocities in Kashmir, especially points of corporate military complicity, uh, revealing, for example, perhaps where Canadian weapons have been involved in the perpetration of atrocities. As we know, the revelation of uh, the of the uh, Canadian involvement in um, or enablement of atrocities by Saudi Arabia and Yemen has been very powerful and at least generating public uh, opposition to those kinds of arm deals. And ultimately, I think we more generally need to fight to preserve a system where Canadians' voices do actually have an impact on the policies that are taken by government, that we don't just have this facade hollow illusion of democracy where what prevails ultimately is always these corporate and militaristic interests, but that we actually preserve the space um, for for Canadian voices to have an impact, which also means the broader work of preserving a democratic space from the incursion of very draconian counterterrorism uh, measures, for example. So in addition to the specific work um, in uh, regarding Kashmir, I think there's also these more structural issues uh, about preserving democratic voice in general that we need to work on. Thank you, Aziza. So we've reached the end of our time together. I want to thank all of our panelists for a lively, compelling, 
brilliant discussion and rousing call to action. It's been an extraordinary evening. I know that um, I have personally learned a lot. Um, it's clear that the very existence of Kashmir is at stake. Um, there is a genocide alert. And so there is no excuse for Canadian silence in the government or in the media. Um, I wanna thank organizers, the organizers again, and all of the supporting organizations um, for their work um, to put this together and to promote it. Um, I just wanna urge people to take action, right? For our audience to urge the Canadian government to speak out, the media to speak out. Canada is complicit in its silence, as our speakers have said. There are a lot of actions that you, that you can take. Um, Justice for All, Canada's letter writing action. Please ask your MP to demand action um, from Canada on Kashmir. Uh, Kashmir, Justice for All, Canada.org slash free Kashmir. You can check out Canadians for Peace and Justice uh, in Kashmir's website, um, cpjk.org. You can sign the um, Canadian Foreign Policy Institute's call for a fundamental reassessment of Canadian foreign policy at foreignpolicy.ca. Thank you to our speakers. Uh, thank you to the audience for tuning in. Have a good evening. That's all for our program today. Thank you.